me if you brought your Bible tonight. Would you hold up the Bible all over the building? Let me ask you to join me, if you will, in the Old Testament once again on page number 486, if you have an old Schofield Bible, or the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 27. Now, there's a 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. We're way back in the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles, chapter number 27. And if you'll locate that, I'm going to read just a phrase of a verse this morning or tonight, and I'll ask you to leave your Bibles open and follow me along through this text this evening. Our buses today did a good job of bringing people to church. We had a total of 319 riders on the church buses today. A good job. I appreciate all the hard work that went into that. And then, of course, uh, you know, a lot of door knocking, a lot of walking yesterday. And then we thank God for the good number. 319 riders on our church buses today. The uh, West Winston route had 20. The Kernersville route had 12. The South Winston route had uh, 40. Uh, one of the Spanish routes had 34. The King Rule Hall route had 33. Another Spanish route had 18. The Mount Airy route had 20. The Murray Road route had 36. Another Spanish bus route had 30. The Pufftown route had 39. The Ogburn Station, 23. The Siloam route had, had 14. And then he put all that together. And uh, we had 319 riders. And best of all, we had somebody saved off the church buses this morning which is a real blessing. Brother White, Brother Tim White called me or texted me a while ago and said that uh, uh, he had one saved over at the truck stop today. And uh, so praise the Lord for people who are getting saved. What a blessing, and we appreciate the Lord's blessings on our services today. Can I ask you a question? How many of you like to uh, pray and get an answer to your prayer? How many of y'all like, would you hold your hand up? Just, now, I'm not tricking you. I mean, just don't be afraid. I saw some of you say, I don't know if I want to raise my hand here or not. But uh, I like to pray and get answers to my prayers, don't you? I, I know, you know, God gives ultimate answers, but I like those immediate answers to my prayers. And I like it when you get up and, man, you just pray, and right there is the answer. Have you ever thought about, have you ever thought about being an answer to prayer? You ever thought about this? You ever just thought about, you know, I, I'm just going to be an answer to somebody's prayer. And boy, thank God for God who answers prayer, but then thank God for people who just say, I'm just going to be an answer to prayer. Well, could I ask you to be an answer to a prayer for me? We are in desperate need of uh, bus drivers right now on our buses. And uh, we've got some folks, you know, that, um, have, that are no longer driving for us. And, and it really makes it hard week in and week out when you have to try to find substitutes for every bus route. And I just want you to know, I'm praying for you. If you've got CDLs and you've got a P endorsement, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. I really am. I wish you'd be an answer to my prayer. I really do. I wish you'd feel the burden for that. I, I, wish, you'd, I wish you'd understand how important it is to provide a way for people to church to and fro. And uh, the record books, you just sang about that a moment ago. God keeping a record of all that. And uh, boy, keeping it in his book and someday at the judgment seat. You know, I'd rather answer to God for why I did what I did and messed up than to answer why I didn't do what God put it on my heart to do because I was afraid I would mess up. Amen. I want to ask you to be an answer to prayer. Well, we desperately need some drivers right now. If you could just volunteer a Sunday, take a Sunday and say, hey, I'll drive one Sunday a month or I'll, uh, I'll drive one Sunday every other month or whatever. Just give one Sunday. I promise you this, you won't be sad you did at the judgment seat. Can I have an amen? I know it's quiet. I get all that. But uh, I tell you what, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. Will you be an answer to my prayer? Let's pray. Father, I sure want to pray for people who sit right here in this building that, uh, that uh, have the qualifications to drive a church bus. I pray for them. God, you know the desperate straits that we're in for bus drivers right now. And God, how difficult it is, how hard it is week in and week out for Brother David to try to reach out to this one or that one and then get turned down and get the nose and call somebody else. I did it the other week and I'm too tired to do it this week or whatever. God, you know the disappointment that goes along with that. But I pray, God, I know you're alive. I know, I know you have power. I just want to ask you to touch somebody's heart in this room, somebody that's already qualified to do that. 
and could just give a couple of hours on a Sunday to drive a church bus for us, pick up little children or pick up adults, as the case may be, and bring them to church. God, you know our heart, our desires to see people come to church and get saved, hear the gospel. And I just want to pray that you would answer my prayer. I pray, God, that somebody would feel that urge and that burden right now to step up and say, hey, you know something, I'll do that. I'll give a Sunday. I'll do that. I pray that you'd burden somebody's heart. And God, answer my prayer, please, in the name of Jesus. We're just wanting to get people in church. God, please burden somebody's heart about this, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want you to join me tonight in just a verse, maybe just a phrase of a verse that we find here. Maybe that kind of goes along with everything we're talking about tonight. But I want you to look at 1 Chronicles chapter 27. Now, we know and understand that previously, and a couple of chapters before this, that David had a list. You know, David was good at keeping lists. And, uh, the, the, or maybe I should say David was good at keeping records. And you know, a couple of chapters before we get to 1 Chronicles chapter 27, David has given a list of his warriors. And we call them the mighty men of David. And he went through that list and he listed them. And if I counted them right, there were 39 of those mighty men. David called them, you know, mighty men, warriors that went out and fought against just insurmountable odds. And yet God blessed them and God gave great victories because they were warriors for the king. And David kept a list of his warriors. When we come to 1 Chronicles chapter 27... We don't find a list of warriors, but we find a list of workers. And you know, in reality, that's what God's people are. God's people are warriors. We're to fight the good fight of faith. We're to put on the whole armor of God. We're to fight the, uh, the battles in spiritual warfare. We're warriors, but we're not only warriors, but we're also workers. Can I have an amen? I hope I haven't ruined the service tonight by asking you to drive a church bus. I kind of feel a little tight right now. And I don't want to feel tight. I want to feel good. I want to feel at liberty. So I just want to tell you I love you, but I sure hope you'll be an answer to my prayer. Amen. Hey, be a warrior. Be a worker for God. And that's what this text is about tonight. David is now listing his workers that he has for himself. And I want you to look down as we look at this list in verse 25. And we have an old boy by the name of Asmaveth in verse 25. And then we come on down and we have, a, uh, we have a, an old boy by the name of Ezra in verse number 26. And following on down, we have, a, uh, the, the Bible talks about a, a boy by the name of Shimei, the Ramathite. And on down in here, there was old Zabdi in verse 27. And then we come to verse number 28. We got another old boy, uh, Belhanan, the Gedriite that's mentioned there. But I want you to look at verse 28, the last Last phrase says this, and over the sellers of oil. Now, when we look at the word sellers, we're not talking about selling things. You know, if you're not careful just reading that, if you're not looking at your Bible, you may just move right over that and think that this old boy sold oil, but he didn't sell oil. I'll tell you what he did. He managed oil. He looked after the oil. And the Bible said there, over the sellers of oil was an old boy by the name of Joash. And for just a little while tonight, I want to preach on this thought right here. I want to preach on seller dwellers. Amen. Thank God for people who dwell in the cellars, who, who serve in out of the way, unnoticed, unappreciated places, such as sitting in the seat of a church bus on Sunday morning or back here cooking a hot dog for a bunch of kids or working in a, in a bus church back there on the other side of the building or wiping noses or maybe even worse, wiping other things in the nursery. Hey, but thank God for people who serve God in the cellars. Their cellar dwellers. And I want to tell you, our church could not operate without some cellar dwellers. Amen. I thank God, you know, there are some very prominent uh, positions in our church, kind of out front where everybody gets to see and everybody gets to hear and watch. I get all that, but I'll tell you what, this church is made up of a bunch of cellar dwellers. Amen. And thank God for people who serve 
in the cellars. I want to preach a little while on the, the Bible uh, calls his name Joash, who was over the cellars of oil. Now, as we move through this list tonight in 1 Chronicles chapter number 27, the one thing that we find is that there are some lists or some positions that David had in the kingdom that were very, very good positions. How were, they were very notable. They were very kind of out front kind of positions. They, they were people who served in very lofty positions. But then as we continue to read this list, we also find out there were some people who served in some not so recognized places. They were not lofty positions. They were lowly positions. In fact, if you look in this chapter, and I kind of highlighted them, but the Bible talks about a, an old boy in verse 29 that was over the herds. Another uh, Bible talks about verse number 30 uh, about an old boy that was over the camels. Another uh, Bible, the Bible talks about in verse 31 about another old boy who was over the flocks. And while there were some very lofty positions, where everybody saw them, and man, it was just a very notable, very noteworthy position. You know, there were other people who had to walk, work around the camels, and there were other people who had to work around the flocks, and other people had to work around the herds. In fact, I noticed if you look back up in verse number 26, there was one old boy that worked in the, in the kingdom, and all he did was just turn the soil over. He was a tiller of the soil. And I got to think, you know, in our church, there are those positions that, that people People look at and and they're and, and they and they're very lofty positions. I think about preaching. You know, I get to preach sermons most of the time when I come to church here. So I'm kind of out front, you know, and I'm I'm kind of right here, and you're looking this way, and and I have one of those positions uh, that are that's probably pretty noticed in church. But you know something? Our church couldn't function without those people working in those not-so-noticed places. Thank God for some people in our church that till the ground. Thank God for some people in our church that work with the flocks. Thank God for people who are watching the camels. Thank God for people. If you look on down, verse 30, it talks about the donkeys there. In verse 30, aren't you glad we got some folks in our church that's looking after the donkeys tonight? I'm talking about some very lowly positions, but here's the thing about it. The king had placed each one of those people in that position, and they were there to honor the king. Some of the glamorous positions, and then some of the gory positions. I don't know what God's placed you in tonight, but I do know this. I would have faithfully tonight discard, discharged my duties wherever it is the king has me. I want to do my best to serve him in that position because I promise you this, when we stand before God at the judgment seat, it's not going to matter whether you're in the nursery or in the choir. What's going to matter most that you were faithful to serve in the place that God had put you in. And right in the middle of this text tonight we read about this old boy by the name of Joash. I can sum his whole life up in just one sentence and that's this. He faithfully served his king in an undesirable desirable, out-of-the-way kind of place with little or no recognition. Boy, thank God for people who serve in our church whose names are never called from the pulpit. Thank God for people who show up service after service. They never get a shout-out from the pulpit. I mean, their name's not ever put in the church bulletin, but they're there. You can just count on them. They're in their place. Hey, they don't care about recognition. They don't care about being noticed. All they want to do is serve God in that out-of-the-way place. Thank God for people like old Joash. And the Bible said Joash was over the sellers of the oil. Now I want to talk a little bit about this cellar dweller by the name of Joash. First of all, I want to talk a little bit, number one, about the duties, the duties of his job. Now we're told there in verse number 28 that he was simply over the sellers of the oil. He was assigned to keep the oil. He was assigned to watch the oil. He was assigned to guard the oil. He was assigned to manage the oil. Now, I know you're sitting there thinking, preacher, a big deal. What's a big deal about having to watch out over oil? What's a big deal with oil anyway? What's so important about oil? Well, you got to understand, in our day, 
it isn't very important. But in King David's day and back in Bible days, oil was a very, very precious commodity. Can I tell you this? The word oil is used 200 times, uh, 202 times in the Bible. In the Bible, we read about a cruise of oil. We read about a horn of oil. We read about a vial of oil. We read about a bath of oil. We read about a measure of oil. We read about a pot of oil. And we read about a box of oil. I'm telling you, oil was precious in Bible days. And the reason that it was so precious is because it was used in a variety of ways. For instance, number one, I can say it was used, number one, for fuel. They used oil for fuel. That's right. I mean, oil was a means of fuel back in David's day. In fact, can I tell you this? In the temple there, in the tabernacle, and later on in the temple that was to be built, there were lights inside of that temple. And the way that those lights stayed burning was they used oil to, as a fuel to burn those lights. And God had commanded that those lamps, those lights, were to never go out. So there was constant need of oil right there in the house of God to keep the lights on in the house of God. It was a type of fuel. In fact, back in the book of Exodus, chapter 27, verse number 20, the Bible said, Thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring pure oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. You know what's the problem with a lot of churches tonight? The lights have gone out. Amen. I mean, buddy, there used to be a light there burning brightly. It was fueled by the oil, which is a type of the Holy Spirit. But now the lights has gone out because people have disregarded the oil that caused the light to burn. Uh, oil was used for fuel back in those days. It's just a side note to this. Remember that parable that we've got in Matthew chapter 25 about the ten virgins? Five were wise and five were foolish. And when the bridegroom came and it was time for the wedding, there were five of them that took no oil in their lamps. And they said to the other five, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. I'm telling you, oil was used for fuel. It was used to keep the lights on in in the house of God. But can I say, secondly, oil was used for medicine. Evidently, there were some medicinal qualities to the oil. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan way over in the New Testament? That boy left Jerusalem, heading down to Jericho, and he fell among thieves. They beat him up, threw him over in the ditch, left him for dead, robbed him, took everything he had, threw him over there, and left him for dead. And the vultures were already circling over his head. And the Bible said that a priest came by, heard the moans and the groans, and passed by on the other side. And the Bible said that a Levite came by, heard the moans and the groans, and passed by on the other side. Can I just stop and say, you know what's wrong with the average church member of our day? They just want to pass by on the other side. You know why we have to beg people to, to drive a church bus? I'll tell you why. They're more interested in passing by on the other side than they are getting in the ditch and getting involved in people's lives and trying to help folks out of the ditch of sin. Will you be an answer to my prayer? Yes, sir. And the Bible said that that good Samaritan came to where he was. I just want to say again, I'm glad that our Savior is on ditch patrol. And he came to that old ditch where that boy was laying at, and he picked him up, got him out of the ditch. And the Bible said in the wounds where they'd left him wounded that he poured in the oil. You see, oil was not only used for fuel. Oil was used for medicine. In Luke chapter 10, verse 38, the Bible said he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil. I don't know what it was, but that oil had some kind of a medicinal quality to it, and it made maybe stop infections and help the wounds heal a little bit better. I'm telling you, oil was needed for fuel. It was used for medicine. Third of all, it was used for commerce. Can I tell you something? In the Old Testament, in 1 Kings chapter number 5, Solomon is right in the middle of building the temple, but he needs some cedar wood to construct the house of God. And we read this in 1 Kings chapter 5 and verse number 10. So Hiram gave Solomon cedar trees and fir trees according to all his desire. And then if you look at verse 11, we read this. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food to his 
his household, and twenty measures of pure oil. Thus gave Solomon to Hiram year by year. You know what they did? They took that oil, and if one country had a need of something, they would give the oil for a, for a product that they needed. Much like in America, we're about out of everything in America. I read this. I didn't read this, but I watched the news this morning before I come to church. And did you know right now there is a shortage on air conditioning units in America? And it's going to be 93 the end of this week. You better pray. I already talked to Todd Linville. There's David sitting back there, and probably there's some other boys in here that's uh, working in heating and air conditioning. And can I tell you, we better pray. Oh, dear Jesus, don't let the air conditioner, boy. Mine's 16 years old. I'm on life support. If that thing goes out, pass out the funeral home vans. It's going to be hard to get through this hot, I'm telling you, there's a shortage on everything in America anymore. I went the other day and tried to buy some windshield wiper fluid. And couldn't even find no windshield wiper fluid. Uh, you say, what happened, COVID? Why can't we get air conditioning in the units, COVID? Hey, why can't you go down to Lowe's and get a bag of dirt, COVID? I'm just telling you, friend, we're in bad shape. But in Bible days, if one country needed something, they would trade the oil for what they needed. It was used for commerce. Can I say, number four, that the oil was used for worship? Can I tell you this? Every sacrifice in the Old Testament had to be anointed with oil. Can I tell you this? Every utensil that was used in the Old Testament tabernacle, all of the uh, furniture that was in the Old Testament tabernacle, the altar itself in the Old Testament tabernacle, and everything that went into that building was anointed with oil. Even the priests that many ministered in the tabernacle had to be anointed with oil. It was used for fuel, and it was used for medicine, and it was used for commerce, and it was used for worship, and it was even used for political reasons. Can you believe that? They even used oil in politics back in those days. You know what? Every time a new king was anointed to be king over the nation of Israel, he was anointed with the oil. That's right. Look at 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David, in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. I'm telling you, it was even used in politics. For me to say it was a precious commodity, that is an understatement. It was important. It was valuable. It was essential to the everyday lives of the people of God. They had to have the oil. And over the sellers of oil was this man by the name of Joash. It was his job to manage, to watch, to protect, to guard the oil. Everything in Israel ran on oil. You had to have oil. Can I even tell you this? In the cleansing of the leper in Leviticus 14, when, I, when an old leper had contracted leprosy, and then by a miraculous divine miracle, he was healed of his leprosy. When he was brought before the priest for the priest to examine him, to pronounce him clean, this is something how the ritual went. It went something like this. When he was pronounced clean, they got two birds. They took one bird and they killed that bird under running water. And they took the blood of that bird, that turtle dove or whatever it was, and they took that blood and they, he put some of it on his thumb and he, or on his hand, and he put the thumb of that leprosy, or that leper. He put some blood on his right thumb. He put some blood on the tip of his right ear, and he put some blood on the toe of his right foot. Now, I'm telling you something. You say, preacher, that's crazy. It might be to us, but it took the blood to wash the sin of leprosy away. Amen. Hey, there's no cleansing without the blood. Everything that's cleansed in the sight of God has to be put under the blood. But it wasn't enough just to do that. Because after that priest put the, his thumb and his ear and his toe in that blood, then he went back and he poured some oil in his hand. And he went back to where he'd put the blood and he took his finger and he put some oil on that blood. And he put some oil on that thumb. And he put some oil on on that great toe because oil is a type of the Holy Ghost. And let me tell you something. You may be washed in the blood, but listen, if you're going to hear God, if you're going to work for God, if you're going to 
walk with God. You got to have the power of the Holy Ghost upon you to live for God effectively. Thank God for the blood, but thank God for the oil of the Holy Spirit to empower us to live for God. I'm talking about the duties, and over all that oil was a no name by the name of Joash. The duties of Joash. Then I got to thinking about this. Not only the duties of old Joash, but I thought about the disadvantages of Joash. Now, when I say disadvantages, if you look back at verse number 28, the Bible said that he worked in the cellars of the oil. Now, when I think about a cellar, I think of what we would call a basement. Is that kind of where y'all are at with this as well? When I think about a cellar, I think about a basement. And when I think about a basement, I think about a dark, damp, uh, I think about a, a dark and, and a damp and a dirty and a dingy place. That's what I think of when I think about a basement. When I think about a cellar, that's what I think about. And the Bible tells us that Joash worked day in and he worked day out in a dark, in a dirty, in a damp, in a, in a dusty, in a musty smelling cellar. Uh, cellar. And that's where Joab, that's where Joash, that's where, where he worked at. That was the conditions in which he worked and he labored. Can I just say that it was an unnoticed job? Can I say that what Joash did over that oil for the most part went unnoticed by the average people of his day? Nobody knew who Joash was. Furthermore, nobody even cared who Joash was. I mean, as far as they're concerned, that's the guy that works underground. That's the guy that's always by himself. That's the guy that mumbles to himself all the time because he ain't got nobody else to talk to. I mean, nobody cared who he was. His job was an unnoticed job. Number two, can I say it was an uncomfortable job. You know what? I think he smelled like where he worked at. Have you ever worked in a restaurant before? If you've worked in a restaurant, you smell like that restaurant. If you've ever worked around deep fryers, and God knows I love french fries with all my heart, but if you've ever went to a restaurant, you can smell the grease in the air. The best way to tell if a restaurant's good or not is if when you sit down in the seat, you stick to it. If you stick to it, that's a good place to eat. If you don't stick to it, it probably ain't going to be no good. If you, don't smell the, 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 if you don't smell the grease of cooking when you walk in, it probably ain't going to be a good place. And Joash, no doubt, smelled like the cellar that he worked in. That darkness, that dinginess. I mean, that dirtiness. And by the way, he probably had to work with a bunch of roaches. He probably had to work with a bunch of snakes. He probably had to run, work with a bunch of rats. He probably had to work with a bunch of cooties. I mean, man, this boy worked in an uncomfortable place. He never knew if it was raining or sunshine because every day looked the same because he is in the cellar. The first job, full-time job that I got out of high school. Back in those days in Mount Airy, the textile industry was big. Now it's tourism industry. God help us. We've replaced tobacco fields with wine vineyards in, 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 in Surrey County. God have mercy on us. You say, we're preaching, we don't need neither. I agree with you, we don't. But I, I've never seen an old boy smoking a cigarette run across the yellow line to wipe a family out because he's drunk with alcohol. And we've traded textiles for tourism. And the first job that I had as a, as a graduated high school senior, I went to work at Pine State Mitt Knitting Mill of all places. And my job was to carry work from one station to the next station. And I worked, everybody that worked in there was a woman. And my job was to pick the sweaters up after they sewed the buttonholes in it and carry it over there to where the ladies who sewed the buttons on it put the buttons on it. And they did piecework. In other words, the, the faster they could go, the more stuff they could do, the more money they would make. And sometimes that material was hard to work with. And so when I'd pick it up from one and carry it to the other, they didn't get mad at the people who made the material. They got mad at me. 
It's my fault they couldn't make a lot of money. I can't tell you how many times as an 18-year-old boy, somebody threatened to have me whooped after, after we got off work by their husband because I brought them the wrong kind of work as if I had a choice in the matter. I tell you, I didn't last long at that job. I didn't last. You know what? It was so dark and gray in there, you couldn't tell if the sun was shining on the out. There were no windows in that place. You couldn't tell if it was sunny or raining or snowing or whatever it was doing on the outside because every day looked the same inside a Pine State knitwear. Well, that's what it must have been for old Joash. I mean, every day looked the same. He never had anybody to talk to. He was always in the cellar by himself. I mean, every day when it came to break time, he ate his peanut butter sandwich, his pack of nabs, and drunk his Pepsi or Coca-Cola or whatever it was. He did that by himself because it was an unnoticed, uncomfortable job. But can I say number three, it was an unappreciated job. I don't think, according to our text, anybody ever went up to Joash and said, thank you for taking care of the oil. I appreciate it, Joash. I appreciate you watching over the oil. I don't think anybody even knew him. In fact, I, I want you to notice this. Look back up, if you will, at verse 25. And the Bible tells us this, and over the king's treasures was Asmaveth. Now, I think everybody knew who Asmaveth was. I mean, man, he, was, he had the smell of money about him. I mean, every day of his life, he, he counted the king's gold and the king's silver and the king's diamonds and the king's emeralds and the king's rubies. He was always around the money. And boy, he had a good reputation. I think every time Asmaveth walked in the grocery store, it was like E.F. Hutton had walked in. It was complete silence. I mean, when he walked in, everybody said, Hey, you know who that is, don't you? And uh, somebody said, who is it? He said, man, that's the guy that counts the king's money. I mean, he had an air about him. I mean, buddy, he was the guy that everybody uh, aspired to be. He was over the king's treasuries. But I can imagine when Joash walked into the grocery store, his eyes were squinty because he is always in the dark. When he walked in, his eyes were squinty. When he walked around, somebody smelled him and said, man, that guy smells like a basement. That guy needs to take a bath. And he was always everywhere he went. He was mumbling to himself. Hum, 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 hum. He, he talking to himself. Am I going to buy this today? No, I don't think I really need this today. Do I need some bread? No, I don't need no bread. Do I need some? I don't need no. I mean, he was, all, he was never around anybody. I mean, buddy, all he could talk to was himself. But I tell you what, bless your heart. Were it not for Joash, the oil would not be managed. I'm just talking about the disadvantages of his job. You know, not everybody's going to acknowledge what you do in the church. Not everybody's going to come up to you and appreciate what you do. But if that's where the king has placed you, then just stick to it. If that's where, the, I feel like I've done dampened the service by talking about the bus routes tonight. Have I dampened the service? I would ask you to forgive me, but I don't mean it. So I'd just be lying about it. But I'm just trying to say tonight, old Joash, I mean, buddy, he served in an unnoticed place. Thank God for people in our church who serve in an unnoticed place. I thought about the duties of his job. I thought about the disadvantages of his job. But I thought about the delight of his job. It may have been uncomfortable. It may have been unappreciated. And it may have been unnoticed. But can you imagine that old boy when he got out and just walked around a little bit? What he thought to himself. I mean, every night when he walked down the street, maybe on his way home, and the lamp, the lamp lights were burning on the streets... You know what old Joe Ash could say? You know, I had a part in that. I'm keeping the streets lit up at night. I'm looking after the oil. Every time somebody went to the doctor and got the feeling a little bit better because the oil had been applied, old Joe Ash must have felt a sense of satisfaction about it all because he was the one who looked after the oil. Every time he walked by the house of God and he smelled the cedar smell coming out the door and he smelled, and he said, you ever smelled cedar wood? 
would before. Don't it smell good? I mean, buddy, and he smelled that cedar as he walked by the house of God. He must have thought to himself, you know something? I had a part in the building of the house of God. Every time he met an old leper, met an old leper that had been cleansed from his leprosy, old Joash must have thought, man, I had a part in the cleansing of that leprosy. But what if Joash would have just quit his job? What if he'd have said like a lot of people do, I hate my job. I don't have time to do stuff like that. I quit. I want out. I'm done. Think about what would have happened in the land of Israel had there not been a Joash who looked after the oil in an uncomfortable, unrecognized, unnoticed position. But thank God for people who stay faithful to the position that God has given them. He may not have got enough, a lot of recognition down here, but can I say this? But there's a record book. My name was written in. Da, 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 da. There's a record book up there. And can I just close by telling you this? God thought so much of it. He put it right here in the King James Bible as an eternal, everlasting record to the fact that there was an old boy who worked in a dark, dingy, dusty, damp basement taking care of the oil. And God memorialized it in the King James Bible. God is keeping a record. Well, you know something? We better take care of the oil. If I said a moment ago, and it is true that oil is a type of the Holy Spirit, somebody needs to watch oil. You know what the name Joash means? It means Jehovah fired. And can I tell you something? Somebody's got to watch the oil. Somebody's got to protect the oil. You want me to tell you the difference between a dead church and a living church? The oil. That's why we better pray for the oil. That's why somebody better protect the oil, manage the oil, watch over the oil, be responsible for the oil. Because if anything at this church is ever going to be done that has eternity stamped with it, stamped on it, it'll be done by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Over the sellers of the oil was Joash. He was a cellar dweller. And thank God for cellar dwellers. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, I pray that.